Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Libraries Equal Education, Your Key to Success. I'm Liz Bowie, Content Manager at DEMCO, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just want to go through some housekeeping details, and then I'll introduce you to our speaker, and she can start today's presentation. On your screens, you should see a question box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or need technical help, please use this box to communicate with us. If we don't get to your question during the session, we'll be posting questions and answers along with the recorded webcast, presentation slides, and resources after the event. You will receive an email in about a week letting you know when everything is available. You'll also notice our presenter's contact information as well as mine. Please feel free to contact us directly with any questions that haven't been answered in the follow-up resources. We're also using Twitter today with the hashtag DemcoIdeas. You should be able to see this hashtag on the side of your screen in the chat box. We're monitoring that feed as well for questions and comments. I believe that's all the housekeeping, so let's get started with the program. As I mentioned, I'm Liz Bowie, and I'm moderating today's session, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our speaker today, Valerie Gross. Valerie has served as president and CEO of Howard County Library System since 2001. She has worked with the Library System Board, staff, funders, elected officials, and the community to implement a new vision for libraries, termed Libraries Equal Education. For living this game-changing vision, Howard County Library System was recognized in 2013 as Library of the Year by Gale and Library Journal. They hailed the Libraries Equal Education Equation, a 21st century model worthy of study and consideration by every library in America, if not the world. The growing Libraries Equal Education movement is ushering in a new era for libraries everywhere. Valerie has delivered more than 100 keynotes, workshops, seminars, and webinars on the strategy, drawing the participation and input of thousands of library professionals from 46 states and more, more than a dozen countries around the world. She wrote about these experiences in her book, Transforming Our Image, Building Our Brand, The Education Advantage. We're so excited to have Valerie with us today to talk about the Libraries Equal Education Initiative. Now it looks like we're ready to get started with the program. So Valerie, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Liz. And welcome everybody. We have global representation today. So whatever your time zone, thank you so much for tuning in. Now I don't know all of your languages, but here are just a few. I'll greet you in. Hello. Hola, guten tag, assalamu alaikum, bonjour, and g'day. We are here to talk about a vision that is really, it works like magic to dispel all misperceptions. So we'll start by imagining the future. Imagine a time when everyone knows precisely what you do. A world where you receive the respect you deserve, a time when you receive top funding priority in any economy. Well, for a growing number of library systems, this best of all possible worlds is right now, and that's due in part to what we are talking about today, libraries equals education. It dispels all misperceptions, it applies to all types of libraries, and it was shaped over a decade by thousands of professionals just like you. So first, let's take a look at you. I mentioned that we are a global community today. Well, there are about a thousand of us from all over the world, the US, all 50 states, five Canadian provinces, and 20 additional countries from Armenia to Uruguay. It's really exciting to have all of you here. And we have so much in common. Um, we also are public library, school libraries, college university, and other libraries. So, so all of us have many, many things in common. And there is nothing we are more proud of than our libraries, whether we're associated with them, the leaders. We have members from all levels of the organization, including two trustees. So thank you all for joining in. First, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all you do to further our profession forward, propel it upward. It is just remarkable where libraries are today, and we do have a flourishing future ahead of us. So this vision is ushering in 
a new era for libraries everywhere. And the vision is not really new. Consider that at the turn of the 20th century, public libraries actually predated many public schools in that they were established to deliver equal opportunity in education for everyone. This was also recognized already back in 89, 1989 by our dear friend, our late friend, Charlie Robinson, who said in simple terms, the public library is an educational institution. For public libraries, what this particular approach does is it positions them on equal footing with other educational institutions, schools, colleges, and universities. For school and academic libraries, it positions them as central to the success of the school, students and faculty, and puts them on par with the other departments. For business libraries, the firm, the law firm, the accounting firm, the, the library is central to the success of the entire business. So that's, that's what this particular approach does. It repositions us as indispensable and, and on par with, with the other highly regarded entities. Externally, what this accomplishes is that misperceptions are once and for all eradicated. You will never again hear, tell me again what you do, and that's because they will understand just by virtue of what you say. You'll get increased respect and most importantly, maximized funding. And that's because they will be assigning you, finally, your accurate value. And internally, what this does is it makes our jobs more fun because now we are working for not just a job, it's a cause, a distinct purpose, and nobody worries about their jobs anymore with this particular approach because we have a flourishing future where we and our work are highly valued. The concepts stem from this notion that we know how valuable we are and what we do, but those outside the profession don't necessarily understand that. There's a disconnect. And we're often treated as second class. Well, we're first class. We're better than first class and our language can correct this. So let's take a look at language. We'll first start by looking at some business concepts. I'm holding up here a bottle of generic water. It could have been purchased at Safeway, Ralph's, the grocery store, anything that is just generic water. How much do you think I paid for six bottles of generic water? Well, you're probably pretty close. I paid a dollar 98. Well, now I'm picking up here and holding up for you a bottle of Avion water. How much do you think I paid for six of these? Well, again, you're pretty close. I paid more than three times the amount, $6.58. Well, in a blind taste test, I actually preferred the generic water. So my first point is the water has to be tasting good. And that's the equivalent of your extraordinary customer service and the great things that you are already doing in your library. But assuming that is already in place, the difference between being funded at the generic level and at the Avion level is the difference between perception. And Avion accomplishes this in part with language. They say, from the French Alps. Avion water starts as snow and rain on the peaks of the pristine French Alps. Protected deep in the heart of the mountains, each drop filters through layers of mineral-rich glacial sands for over 15 years. Ooh, I want to buy Avion. And they have rejuvenation and detox on here, all words that are, that are very, very attractive. And there's also something else about Avion. You want to be associated with Avion. And we would like that, too, for our libraries, to people to be really proud to be benefiting from us and associated with us. So we want that. So the secret to becoming the avion of libraries is not just what we do and how we do it, but how we talk about what we do. Now some of you are thinking, well, couldn't we have a better aspiration to be more like, say, Harvard University or Google? And the answer is yes, but work with me here for a moment because the funding concept is so good with the water analogy. So we'll go with the 
Avion desires for now. So in the next half hour or so, we will look at the state of the library, a little bit more about language, libraries equals education, the strategy, and then how we view ourselves, some results, some implementation, and then what we can learn from the schools. The examples that we'll use are typically from public libraries, but they can be modified for the other library types. Consider that almost one-third of Americans do not know what libraries do. And I suggest to you that the other two-thirds don't really either. How, what's the percentage, do you think, of Americans that would know what schools, colleges, and universities do? Yeah, probably 100%. Well, that's where this approach can take us. 100% of America, and because we are global today, the world will understand the value, and precisely what we do. This image depicts the state of affairs for libraries during the recession. It was not pretty. Here's an example from Connecticut. We're getting back to basics. Police, fire, and education, and clearly they don't include libraries there because they say libraries are not essential services, and they proceeded to cut. Same thing for Virginia. 30% over two years. Later, 2013, this took place in Florida. The age of the library is probably ending was the justification to propose cutting nearly half of Miami's branches. Now, only four were cut, but that was still a very misguided notion that, that this would be the case in any event. And, and to propose cutting all of those branches, absolutely misguided. And it continues. Earlier this month, we learned that Oregon's Douglas County will see 10 of their 11 libraries close, the last one soon to follow. State funding has also been cut over the years. 24% was reported in 2014 in Ohio. And I have this because this was more than simply just a cut. It wasn't even an emergency. It was cutting the libraries by a million dollars to replace the state's rainy day fund. Again, a, a decision that was made because they don't understand. School libraries as well. This was Chicago. They're down to 160 from 454 school librarians in 2012. And Last month, we learned that the University of Massachusetts in Boston would be receiving a 20% cut in funding. It's also international. This is an example from Canada. And it's also at the national level. The House proposed to eliminate IMLS in 2015. It had also proposed this during the recession. Last year, the proposal was to cut IMLS by a million dollars. And yet, the U.S. Department of Education got an increase of $1.3 billion. During the recession, it was actually $6 billion that they infused into the U.S. Department of Education. Well, if we align ourselves with education, we will then be able to get some of these billions of dollars as well at the federal level. So what's a typical solution? The typical responses our profession gives in response to these absurd decisions, these absurd cuts, just the absurdities with, with which we are regarded and, and misunderstood, well, tell them your story. Tell them why you are important. Well, there's nothing wrong with any of these responses, but do you see the, the challenge with each of these? They require work. And in spite of all of our efforts, we still seem to not be able to convey our accurate value. Well, do you ever get tired of this? In Howard County, back in 2001, I joined this library system here, and I was taken aside by a very gracious county council member, and she said to me, Valerie, you're not even on the radar. We'll be needing fewer branches, not more, less money invested, because the internet will be replacing the need for libraries. Well, I went back to the team and I said, this is, this is crazy. What, where, how, why are they, what, what's, what's the problem here? And we realized that our language was creating 
the problem. So we started looking at language and what we were actually conveying with our language. And we realized that if we changed some of our language, we would never again have to explain because the language would speak for itself. So let's take a look at language. The power of words. If I tell you I'm going to give you a nutritious snack, what's your response? What if I say I'm going to give you a delicious snack? Well, some of you might prefer nutritious, others delicious, but you see the power of language. It's the very same snack. How about this? Which do you value or support more? A used car or a certified pre-owned vehicle? What do you support or value more, drilling for oil or careful exploration of energy? Well, the latter also includes drilling for oil, so we might want to use this particular approach to our advantage on occasion. We're now going to look at three industries. The first changed from one word to two, and the next two changed one single solitary word to transform their image. Yes, the lowly prune. What did they change to? Dried plums. So now it's as hip and healthy as dried pears or dried apricots when before it was what? Senior and medicinal. How about this? The liquor industry. What did they change to? Spirits. Liquor, which is the low life, is now friends and a toast, and they want you to associate with that. And my last example, gambling. What did they change to? Gaming. So what was perceived as an addiction is now a choice, a family vacation. So you see the power of language here. They have revolutionized their image with one word. We too have the power to achieve just that. And no, Jody is not our word. But I give you Jody because this is the first time time I used this back in 2008. I, like many of you, sit on boards. Actually, two of you do sit on boards. And we had an exercise. I was supposed to introduce Jody and she, me. This is a, a, a retreat at the beginning of, of the year. And so one of the questions we were to ask each other was, what does your organization do? And Jody asked me that. Remember two-thirds of Americans who think they know what we do but don't? Jody fell into that category. She said, what does your organization do? And I said, we deliver equal opportunity in education to literally everyone in Howard County. Jody picked her jaw up off the floor and she said, wow, I thought you were going to say you long books. I said, oh, we do, seven million last year. That's the first pillar of our educational mission, self-directed education. It includes books, ebooks, anything our experts make available to you, the customer, to borrow and access when you need it. The second pillar is research assistance and instruction, classes that we teach for students of all ages. And the third pillar is instructive and enlightening experiences, the community building component, the partnerships, the author events, bringing the community together to discuss and experience ideas. Jody was just floored. She repeated all that to the group, and I suggest to you that they, the 25 movers and shakers in that room left with not only a higher regard for Howard County Library System, but also every single one of yours because of the language that I chose to describe who we are and what we do. So our word is clearly education. Now the first thing to understand about this is what this vision is not. It is not we play an educational role, or we support education, or even that we're an educational resource. That's all way too small. Do you see what any of these three statements does? It implies that all we do is support the school's curriculum, which we do and we must, and we must do so brilliantly because they are a key component of our customer base. But this vision is way, way too small. The vision that we're talking about is we are education. Education is our role. Do you see the difference? Equal footing with the schools or the departments. Stand up tall and take this credit and, and be education. 
the notion that we teach people how to think, we enable people to have access to self-directed education. The development of the mind lasts a lifetime. So the definition of education that we are talking about includes not just supporting formal education, but our own education, which also includes information, there's our favorite word about a subject matter, knowledge acquired by learning, activities that impart knowledge, the process of acquiring knowledge, and an enlightening experience. So what in our overall curriculum falls outside of these definitions? Well, maybe copying and fax services. That's an ancillary service that is not part of this. And like schools, we have social workers, uh, the comp comparable to a school nurse or a, a guidance counselor. But that doesn't preclude us from calling ourselves an educational institution. So there's the definition. Everything we do falls under that. It's important to note that education is the key to the world's problems, to solving them. It's our highest priority. We hear our elected officials say, education is our highest priority. That's the case for Howard County's county executive and also our governor here in Maryland. And presidents of the United States, John F. Kennedy and President Obama, biggest impact in our future comes to education. That's when they funded $6 billion to the Department of Education and proposed eliminating IMLS. That's how much they value education even during a depression. Uh, excuse me, a recession. So we've taken a look at this approach. And we've already looked at the library as an educational institution or at a university or college or a firm, a key department. There's a second component we need to position ourselves as educators. And then position everything we do under these three pillars. This is what I used for Jody. There you see those. I want to mention that under the third pillar, it includes all the great work of the Harwood Institute, all the great work of the New York libraries in the area of sustainability. That actually crosses all three pillars. And those of you who are really doing great work in the civic engagement or to civility initiatives, that falls under the third pillar, the partnership itself, and then it crosses all three pillars. But those are hot topics, and you'll get more funding for that if you position that under the pillars and underneath the education umbrella. There's another reason to consider using these three pillars, not just because Jody can repeat them very easily, but because take a look at these headlines. Can libraries survive the ebook revolution? Do we need libraries? They're under threat. How do you keep a library relevant in the digital age? Well, all of these headlines will completely be eliminated if you use these three pillars, and that's because they are timeless. The future of the library will no longer be predicated on the future of the book because people want to understand that we, like schools, colleges, and universities, are timeless. A hundred years ago, we needed self-directed education. Today we do. A hundred years from now, we will. And, and that is, uh, again, the reason you will never again hear, oh, well, gee, I get everything I need off the internet. I don't need the library. We don't need libraries. It's a waste of taxpayer money. So like schools, colleges, and universities, we will be fully valued and understood as part of the education enterprise that is necessary for economic advancement and quality of life. Here are some suggested phrases with the word education. We are a key component of Chicago's strong education system. Line of work, if you get that on the airplane, Say you work, you're in the field of education. Talk about your staff as a team of educators and support staff. That your occupation, you're an educator. You're in education. The tax season is coming up, so consider signing that educator. Just a comment about lifelong learning. We've said this phrase for years. Our elected officials do not say our highest priority is learning. And in spite of our use of this phrase over the decades, People still don't understand what we do 
So consider swapping out that phrase for any of these and you will be on your way to the Avion funding that we deserve. Some of you are thinking, well, okay, I get this, but what about the reasons that so many people come to the library for fun, discovery, curiosity? The answer is never, ever lose this because this is the best way to inspire people to avail themselves of all our collection and to come and take a class and, and to experience uh, an author together. It is this, this curiosity. So always use these terms but put them in context of the education and the value. Use the strong words in connection with this. And just note that colleges and universities copy us as well. The, this is a university that is touting its, its Loyola, fueling your curiosity. In 2008, the first time we used this in the state of Maryland, just wanted to give you this example, we gave this to the gubernatorial candidates at the time. And the question that came to our committee was where would you rate libraries in importance relative to other state services? We edited this question to public libraries are pillars of education. In your administration, how would you enhance public libraries and how would you incorporate public libraries as you further the educational goals for the state? So we gave them, it was a teaching opportunity and we gave them a question that they would need to answer with the terminology that we used. Well, we didn't track the results, but fortunately, in Michigan, two years later, Doreen Hannon used this in a meet and greet. I can't show this on the webinar. It's not possible with the technology today, but do consider go looking at, go view this, because you'll see that each of the 14 state, federal, and local candidates running for office answered libraries are the most important part of education. Everything is on the table except Medicaid and education, and within that umbrella is public libraries. I suggest to you that none of them would have answered this way had it not been for the phrasing of that question. It's very powerful. So the third part of this approach is using and subscribing to some strategic vocabulary, switching out terms that we don't even think about what, we, what they are conveying to the outside world. So I'll just give you a handful of examples. The first one is story time. We took a look at this and said, oh, we could do so much better than this. Back in 2006, we saw this. That's our county executive at the time who was then state senator. And we had seen this picture on the front of a calendar at the school system. And that was a class, and it had all kinds of education words. And here we get a headline, story time with the county executive. So we started looking at the definition of that word. And in many workshops that I had the privileges, privilege of, of presenting over, over the last decade, consensus is that story time conveys play, recreation, and babysitting. And a young lady in Michigan who was a children's instructor raised her hand pale. She said, nothing. What she meant was that the term trivializes our value, both her in, in her expertise and also the content of the classes that she taught. Right around this time, too, we spotted this article in the newspaper, Kinder Musique Classes. This was at the community college. And take a look at some of this 45-minute class, vocal play, singing, interaction between students, ah, social skills. Each session has a theme. This one was milk and cookies. And then teaches the class. Well, we looked at this and we said, huh, we have something that's quite similar to this. But what were the differences between that one and our, and I'm sure you all have a story time that looks like that. Well, they call it a class, and we call it story time. They use the verb teach, and we use the verb, it's really sad when you think about it, we say do. They say by a teacher and instructor, we say programmer. There's cost money, and for the public library, it's free of charge. Well, then and there, we decided to start calling all of our story times preschool classes. And here you have them, year-round preschool classes. 
Children's instructors teach social skills, listening comprehension, and the foundations of reading through letters, numbers, and vocabulary. So if you are a governor or a county executive or a mayor, what are you going to fund more? Story time or a preschool class that teaches the foundations of reading? It's really quite that simple. Same thing for the word program. What does that mean to the outside world? Well, not at all the way we use it. And the young lady in Michigan said, nothing. It doesn't convey anything. Once again, we turn to our Howard Community College friends. They had a beer appreciation class. There it is, $29. Uh, please bring a glass, not plastic, a bottle of water, crackers, and paper towels. Genealogy, English afternoon tea, juggling, and my favorite, happy hair. And that is held at a salon, a, a hair studio. Now, I'm not poking fun at the community college for holding these classes. I'm simply pointing out we have what we call programs that are identical to these classes. Again, the difference is they call it a class. Ours is a program. They use the verb teach. What do we use? Present, offer. They say teacher, instructor, faculty, professor. And again, for us, it's usually a librarian, library associate, programmer, and they charge tuition. So here again, we switched out program in favor of classes, seminars, and workshops. And for the programs for kindergarten through grade five, those two became classes, teach subjects, math and science through children's literature. literature. Again, you see the difference between Avion funding and generic immediately. Programming, another favorite word of ours, consider any of these phrases depending on what you intend its meaning to be. Reference. The outside world understands this definition of reference. And notice that it doesn't include our definition. That's because there's a word that means precisely what we mean when we say the word reference, and that word is research. Inquire into. Systematic investigation to establish facts. So consider switching out reference and using research, in-house research materials instead of reference materials. Well, what about information? Unfortunately, this is the, one of the biggest causes of our challenges. It is passive, directional, it is ubiquitous, I get everything I need, all the information I need. So instead, try using the words education, research, or instruction. We have to use the word information when we say I've conducted this research on your behalf, Here's the information that I found. But this notion that we are education will elevate the perceived value and people will understand why we are imperative and indispensable. Here I'll touch on just the top one. Circulation to the outside world means things that go around in circles or maybe health-related uh, blood through our veins, right? So consider instead customer service. Borrowing, loan, borrowing statistics, loan statistics. My last example, programs and services. Well, we've already established that programs really doesn't convey a whole lot. And services, that's kind of a nothing word as well. It means performance of duties helpful to others. So again, you're going to get generic funding at best when you use this phrase, programs and services. So consider swapping that out for another incredibly powerful word, curriculum, which means all the courses of study offered by an educational institution, any plan of activities, transformative experiences. So look at this. Our three pillars, everything we do, this can be referred to as our curriculum. Now this is a little bit like green olives or dry white wine or sharp cheddar cheese. It doesn't roll off the tongue right away, but just try it on for size, and soon you will absolutely love it. It's very powerful. It commands respect. It is an avian word, second only to the word education. We'll touch on titles. If I tell you I'm an instructor, what do you think I do? Teach. If I say I'm a librarian, what do you think I do? Sit around and read books all day or say, shh. So consider using working titles, because 
volunteers are understood that they can run libraries. It could be done on old building with folding tables and used bookshelves. Remember the unlibrary effort in New Jersey that could be operated by volunteers? And in colleges too, college students have little sense of who librarians are or what they do. And earlier this month, outsiders think that those who administer and, and run libraries are obsolete. And so let's teach people precisely what we do, and the easiest way to do that is with working titles. So consider instructor and research specialist or any one of these options. For circulation clerk, how about? Customer service specialist. Programmer, unless it's computers, instructor, facilitator, educator, teacher. And director, city librarian, county librarian, consider the director is an a, a middle management position in the academic and business world. You wouldn't have the director of a university. You have a president, usually. And you wouldn't have a city teacher running a school. You'd have a superintendent. So these are some suggestions. Executive director is better than director. It's still a middle management position, but it's an improvement. Better president and CEO, just president or CEO. And this is gaining across the country and beyond. Here is an example from Kansas. Wonderful titles, really impressive, Avion level. Just a comment about teacher. To be an expert in one's field, one can teach parents as teachers. To be teaching at a private school, you don't necessarily need a certificate. We are experts in our fields, and so we can reference ourselves as teachers. How we view ourselves. It is absolutely imperative to first understand that how we view ourselves will then be how others view us. We can't expect others to switch until we do internally. So here's an example of a very dangerous t-shirt. At ALA you can buy a t-shirt that says endangered. We, yes, it's funny, but it sends a very dangerous message, as does any of these phrases. Let me ask you, if you were investing in a company, how much money would you invest in a company whose goal was to remain relevant? You would run. So consider swapping out any of those phrases for we deliver high quality education for all. We design and deliver a world class curriculum through three pillars and then name them. So remember story time? Well, two years later, library has classes for ages three through five. We are then included with the school system and community college finally in 2014 in the tourism guide. Our statistics doubled, tripled, and quadrupled. And most importantly, our capital budget doubled, uh, excuse me, our capital budget went from zero to 116 million. Remember the radar that we weren't even on? Well, now we have a brand new branch, and our operating budget doubled to $22.5 million. Others have experienced some successes as well. This is in Minnesota. Got a budget increase when every other library continued to see dramatic funding cuts. Monty Manning in Indiana, simply stunned by the power of the E word. He got funding. He didn't even get asked questions. They funded him immediately to his surprise. Vicki Stever in Florida incorporated the three pillars in a speech, and at the end, there was not a single negative word. It's the first for her in the three years that she's been in dress, addressing the commission. In Oklahoma, used the libraries equals education approach. They gave them, on their own, funding. In Michigan, positive experience with the press. In Virginia, they started a new partnership because the partner finally understood why they would want to partner with them. I mentioned this was an international solution in Haiti. Research department replaced reference. A couple of other slides. This is someone acknowledging that educators, we should be positioning ourselves as educators. Educators was added by Library Journal to Movers and Shakers. Urban Libraries Council recognizes that libraries are education. 
educational institutions, and ALA President Todaro recognizes that we should be designated as educational institutions. Also, the ease of libraries now, the first one is education, so we're seeing ALA come on board. It's a really nice article here about Creston, Crestview Public Library in Florida. They have seen real successes with the vision. Here are some slides from websites where you see the strong terminology, adult classes, Louisville in Texas, a vibrant center for education, weekly children's classes, these were story times before, Oklahoma, Libraries Equals Education is the first thing on their website, Michigan, classes for all ages, baby bounce, terrific, Ohio, classes and events, high quality public education for all, and my final example, providing education for all stages in life of life. This is our neighboring county here in Maryland. Implementing the vision, every communication is a teaching opportunity. Your program guide can transform into classes and events guide. You can use this on your annual reports and strategic plan. Your statistics can have those headers. Signage is terrific. This used to be our information desk. This used to be our story time room. And you can use it as you build and renovate public education for all. Your thank you notes can use the terminology. Better yet, add the visual. At Legislative Day last week, we used buttons here in Maryland. Everybody wore these to, to, just to immediately convey to the elected officials that we are their highest priority. And in Kansas, they've ordered 643 t-shirts with libraries equals education on them. So do partner with the other educational institutions because it aligns you with the already understood definition of education. And do this brilliantly. Many of you already do. If you don't do Battle of the Books, consider implementing this competition. We'll be happy to share details with you. It is our most well-attended academic competition of the year. My final example is what we can learn from the schools. This used to be our pie chart for our budget. You'll see 79% salaries and benefits. Oh my goodness, you're expensive. Well, this was the schools that I found. Look at that, 44.5% for instruction. Guess what that is? Yeah, salaries. 12.5% for special ed. Again, salaries. A lot of these are salaries, so we looked at this. We did our own calculation, and now almost 50% of our budget goes towards instruction. What a great investment. So you can see how one can use and learn from the schools for the benefit of getting Avion funding, because finally people understand. So two great questions for you to ask. What would the schools, colleges, and other departments do? Would they do that? Would they say that? And if the answer is yes, great. If not, perhaps you could consider rewording it. We deliver high quality public education for all as an outstanding crystal clear mission statement. You can put everything else in bullet points under it. And for the academics, we deliver high quality education for ABC school, college, university, students, faculty, and staff. Everything else you say, you can put in bullet points underneath that. So imagine a world if we were to switch our entire profession from equal access to information to equal opportunity in education. Just imagine the results. I hope you'll consider joining this growing movement. If you'd like to learn more, this book that I've written is here. It's available on Amazon and it explains what and why and how and gives all kinds of examples for terminology and what to switch out. If you'd like to use the three pillars image, it's available at those two websites. Also on March 9, there is an upcoming on-conference keynote that uh, is half on libraries equals education and half on choose civility. I invite you to attend that. Here are some upcoming webinars. I just have this here. It's also on librarieseducation.org if you're interested in ALA upcoming webinars and conference sessions. And I'll close with, now that you've all experienced this, we can articulate our Vision in six words or fewer.
high quality public education for all. Four words. Well, actually, let's go to two words. Education, everyone. And we can articulate our vision, which is the key to our success, in one single solitary word, and that word is education. Thank you all so very, very much at this point, Liz. I'll give it back to you for if anybody has a question. Thank you so much, Valerie. Wonderful information. It does look time, uh, looks like we have time for a couple questions from our listeners. And just a reminder for everyone, we will have the, the full Q&A email to you next week if we don't get to your question today. So, Valerie, uh, one of the first questions that came in from our listeners, do you have any tips for helping to start the dialogue uh, to partner with some of those outside organizations such as schools? Well, to partner with organizations, they have to understand. Oh, let me put on my webcam here. Hello, everyone. Well, so to partner with other organizations, they first of all have to understand why they would like to partner with you. So some library systems have a hard time getting the school systems to want to partner with them. It's because they don't understand why. If, as you begin using this terminology, they will want to partner with you because they will understand how their students benefiting from your curriculum benefits them, makes them smarter students, and then and then the partnership um, can can flourish that way. It requires it requires constant communication. In Howard County we have a comprehensive partnership where each school has an assigned branch and a liaison. And we have quarterly meetings with an advisory panel and we have an end of the year meeting. We have A plus curriculum. It's called something wonderful. There are a couple of these partnerships that are examples across the country. We want to take a look at all of those. But mostly if you start using this language and then communicate and make the effort, they will want to meet with you and then work together for the benefit of the students. The library wins because again you align yourselves with that already understood definition of education. And then K through 12 and college students, key customer base, key component of our customer base. So so to assist them with what they are working on right now to 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 contribute to their academic success. Both what we have in the library, what we can take into the schools, bring the schools into the library, and then some of these academic competitions. We have a whole place on our website that is the A plus partnership. You'll see Everything about Battle of the Books that I highlighted, also the HCLS Spelling Bee, we have Goldberg Challenge, there's a Bumblebee for grades one through three. We have high tech STEM education initiative for teens that we just held a hackathon. And, and so there's there are details about all of that. We'd be happy to help you if you would like to begin any of those. But to to put together a partnership where you meet with the leaders of the school. So get a meeting with a superintendent and if the superintendent won't meet with you, meet with the assistant superintendent and, and go from there. Thanks Valerie. Um, just to kind of offshoot on that question a little bit, um, can you talk about how other ed educational institutions in your community reacted to the changes you made to you, the verbiage you were using, especially the school board? Well I understand that the evolution is rather slowly. You, you start by using some of the terminology internally. You maybe write it. You speak it when you present. You talk to people using, you sw swap out one word at a time. And keep in mind that the outside world already understands this language. Mostly, it's, it's internal that feels awkward. If you call a program, a class, a seminar, or a workshop, the people already coming to those understand precisely that that's what it is. So it's no big deal to them. In fact, finally, you're, you're, you're using language that they, they, that they understand. And, and so it is, here in Howard County, we actually had to lobby to get out from community services into the education tab at the county budget. We here in Howard County have to lobby every year for our funding. So Everything that comes to us does not go to the fire department, does not go to the school system, does not go to the community college or the police or the roads. So we have to really make a strong case for what we need. And we used to go lobby, for, uh, testify at the public hearings in the community services arm. When we were moved over, it took about three years to get them to do that, but they finally agreed to do that, we then showed up the evening where also 
the school superintendent was testifying and the president of the community college and their respective board members. So here I came along with the board chair, some other testifiers, and, and they said too, first of all, oh, what are you doing here? And so I would explain, oh, well, we're actually also an educational institution. We've been, our, our category has been corrected, and so here we are. So initially it was a little bit of a surprise, but then over time it was of course. And now it's a trio where the three educational institutions in the county, school system, community college, library system, and the county executive in the his state of the county address last week talked about that. His highest priority is education, includes the school system, the library system, and the community college. It's, it's the first thing, and so it benefits us in, in many ways. So over time, none of this happens overnight. I think the audience has the advantage that so many others now have implemented this, that it is no longer as different. And, and so you've got three, well, the, the, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, it's kind of just right now. And the oatmeal, so to, to partake and, and test the waters, I suggest that, that people try this and see what the response is. But again, it's, it's been now introduced and it is, it is less different. So I think, it's, I think it will be very well received. Great failure, thank you. Uh, we have another, another question here about summer reading program. What about the terminology for the summer reading program? How can we rebrand um, re the programming and, and give the idea that summer, the summer reading program is an, an educational resource without turning off the children? Well, the discussion about that has included summer reading programs can become summer reading clubs. And I know some people do summer reading, summer learning. We have steered clear from that, again, because we have overused the word learning. You clearly have to have learning and education going together. But again, as we teach our electeds that we are education, we're trying to use that. And so we talk about our summer reading clubs being a key component of our educational mission. That is a key component of our curriculum over the summer. It also crosses three pillars. The kickoff falls under pillar three. Any classes that we teach in conjunction with summer reading, whatever the subject matter is, falls under two. Any research that students of any age might be conducting on the subject would fall into that. And then we have under pillar one all the books and materials that the kids, we have adult clubs as well, may borrow, and that is pillar one. We also work with the schools, have been doing so for many years. We used to kind of resist that, if I'm remembering correctly. It was, well, they can do their own lists. We can do ours. Why would we want to work with them? Well, it makes all the sense in the world to do that. If you have your, their summer reading list for their students, you can put it on yours. You can even put the dots on if, if that's what they have, the green dot books. And so the students then come to the library to, to borrow those. So it's a nice partnership component. Summer reading clubs was our solution to, to that. And uh, it's, it sounds like fun. And, you know, I think this year we're doing something completely different, and I'm not quite sure what that is, but clubs up until last year is, is what we had been using. Thanks, Valerie. Um, we have a question about some more terminology. Is outreach still a good term, or should it be something um, different like community engagement instead? Well, I would put the question back out to, to the audience. Outreach doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I'm not quite sure what the person asking the question means when the term outreach is there. So maybe to ask the rhetorical question, what is actually meant by that word? Is it marketing? Is it public relations? Is it community engagement? I think maybe one of those three would be probably what the person means. And, and so um, potentially one of those three. If, if, if it means looking for ways to teach a particular segment of the community. Like, I, I just got back from Vietnam and visited some libraries there. You have to pay money to borrow books in Vietnam. So how do we, how do, we do outreach, right? How do we connect with, maybe that's the terminology, with the, the Vietnamese community here to teach them, to let them know there is no cost. 
You may borrow 60 books. You're not limited to two books. You may come and use it freely. So, so to make sure that they understand. And, and so if that is the meaning of the outreach, then it is to, to, to communicate and, and, and connect with. So, so maybe community engagement, Liz, you mentioned that first, would be, would be the terminology. Great, thank you. We have a couple different questions, um, kind of the same, the same question. Some concerns about does it ever deter um, children or young adults? Does, does using the terminology program or class instead of program deter children or young adults or people who might not have had the best experience with educational classes uh, from attending those? Yes, the key is to make it fun. And uh, the, the person asking the question has a very good point about teens. You don't want to talk to teens about classes, seminars, and workshops. For them, you want to talk about how fun it's going to be in the content of the class. It's you will eat bugs and learn how to fry them and what cultures eat these. You know. So we dare you to eat this. You, you need to be connect, com communicating. It's a little bit like the uh, earlier, I, I used the word nutritious and delicious to describe a snack. You want to use the terminology that's going to, to entice the people. I don't think it's the case with children. And the people who are coming to your, your classes know that they are classes and worthwhile. So to, to, be, to be describing them as such, I can practically guarantee that you will double your audience because the people who aren't coming do not understand that they are classes that have educational value. And the reputation of them being fun is what you want to continue. It's this discovery, it's this fun, it's, it's, it's this notion of curiosity to always develop that again. The experiential learning the schools are actually copying us for that. I think that's um, in, in a, a real um, compliment. And, and so we know how to deliver education. We just need to take the credit for it. And if you sit down at a story time and you say, hi, I'm Valerie. I'm going to be your instructor today. This class will be focusing on the color yellow, the number one, and we'll be talking about zoos today. And, and so they're going to understand that that's a class and they're going to be clamoring for more. And to describe them as classes will bring a new audience in that, that just never thought that it was worthwhile before. I, that has not been the experience by anybody I know who has switched out the terminology. Wonderful, thank you. Great advice. Uh, it does look like we're out of time for today, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we would like to thank Valerie for sharing her vision and her insights with us today. And we hope that everyone was able to take away some newfound knowledge to support their own initiatives. A recording of this webcast will be available on the Demco Ideas and Inspiration website by next week, and that's ideas.demco.com. So you can review the presentation and you can share it with your colleagues. And next week, you'll also be receiving an email that will include the slides, a resource list, and the full Q&A. You'll also be receiving a survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did. So please take a few moments to give us your feedback and thoughts on future webinar topics. And we hope that you're able to join us for our upcoming webinar, Connecting Schools and Public Libraries Through Data, on March 8th. And you can register now on ideas.demco.com. Again, thank you for joining us today, and thank you, Valerie, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone.